Right, we should get started. Um, my name is Michael Lachney. I'm going to be uh, chairing this panel. Um, the panel is called Ethics of Connections. Networks aren't neutral. They perform an implicit function in how and where they link their members and serve as ethical actors in their own right. Uh, we will begin with, with Joshua McWerther, a researcher, audio producer, and MA candidate uh, in theories of urban practice at the Parsons School of Design here in New York City. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. I'm very grateful to be here and to participate in the panel. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about my research, which focuses on locative media, more specifically location-based mixed reality mobile digital media, much like the kind popularized by Pokemon Go. Though my interest in this topic is rooted in another locative game called Ingress, and a po which is Pokemon Go's predecessor upon which many of its main gameplay functions and are modeled after. So I'll discuss Ingress intermittently throughout the presentation, though I won't go too deeply into its complex plot or gameplay, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody after the presentation about my field work with Ingress in particular. So mixed reality locative media is not as new as one would suspect. And not only have I tried to historicize the medium's various iterations and gaming, art, and annotative or narrative platforms over the past 20 years, but, but I've also connected these media to critical urban issues and investigated their infrastructural and ideological dimensions, problematizing both the global pos positioning system and its military industrial entanglements, and the kinds of network spatial logics and normative urban imaginaries that are deployed and reinforced through these interfacial media. So my research is also driven by questions that are provoked by the hybrid spaces created, created through locative intermingling of real and virtual. What new issues arise when the politics of the digital meet the politics of the street, and what new forms of sociality emerge within this milieu. However, before I dive into all of that, I kind of want to fall back on some very classic theory and talk a little bit about Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project. So in this famous unfinished work of historical materialism, Benjamin used a unique methodology which sought to collapse past into present through a recognition that, it, quote, image is dialectics at a standstill. He operationalized this idea through a technique called literary montage, a collage-like assembling of different texts into, quote, large-scale constructions out of the smallest and most precisely cut components, which you discover in the analysis of the small individual moment, the crystal of the total event. So Benjamin's objects of analysis were, were what he considered to be dialectical images. These material artifacts whose embedded social relations he would unpack as a means of examining the social origins of his own time, in particular the interwar European culture, uh, through the material culture of an earlier time, 19th century Paris. So in my research, I've been trying to sort of treat locative media and mixed reality gaming, such as ingress, as both a form of transmediated literary montage and as a dialectical image, or perhaps more appropriately, a cyborg image after Donna Haraway, whose cyborg metaphor extends, and I think, in my opinion, deepens that kind of sense of a Marxist dialectic, suffusing it with a deeper understanding of, of techno-social mediation, an understanding that I'm here applying to the interfacial mediation of human experience in urban environments. So, on one hand, locative media functions as montage and layering the space of the screen onto real urban space, setting up this tension between virtual and real spaces and networks. On the other hand, the media are themselves as an object of inquiry, a dialectical, or as again, as I said, cyborgian. I would argue that the relations embedded within locative mixed reality media can, like the Parisian arcades did for Benjamin, illuminate some of the social origins of our own precarious, fragmented, and hyper-real moment. As I mentioned, pulling at, this, at these relational threads has led me from interface to infrastructure and representation, to looking at how the surveilling logics of the global positioning system and its military origins intersect at times in startlingly direct ways with the neo-Cartesian panoptic, panoptic, objective, and thus implicitly hegemonic epistemologies of digital mapping tools such as Google Maps and Google Earth. And I'd like to describe just a quickly an anecdote which illustrates this kind of startlingly direct connection between an institution of warfare, for example, and locative media. So as geolocation technologies began proliferating through Western consumer markets in the late 1990s, a tech-savvy entrepreneur named John Hankey created a startup company called Keyhole Inc., which was funded largely by a CIA-run venture capital firm named InQtel. And that Keyhole Inc. sought to develop new 3D digital cartographic applications based in part on the precise location data available through GPS. 
Keyhole's Earth Viewer application, in addition to finding early users in the military and intelligence communities, also became a popular visualization tool for news agencies at the start of the US invasion of Iraq, bolstering the company's popularity and market share. So Keyhole was purchased by Google in 2004, and its Earth Viewer application was rebranded and re-released as Google Maps and then later Google Earth. Years later, the founder of Keyhole Inc., John Henke, still under the umbrella of Google, would later found and incubate a game company called Niantic Inc., which is the developer of both Pokemon Go and Ingress. So this relational analysis of locative mixed reality media has also forced me to be considered as one element in an assemblage of computational technologies, interfacial and geolocative, but also addressive in other ways, like the networked objects comprising the Internet of Things, that produces its own kind of theoretical hybrid space, where the virtual space of the Internet and the space of the city feed back into one another. So locative mixed reality media then can be seen as a tool for conceptually exploring and even mapping hybrid space, the space of the mediation itself. And through its various iterations in art, storytelling platforms, or massively multiplayer games, even as a means of probing the social and political dispositions of urban space. So in effect, these kinds of applications are, even in their most seemingly innocuous forms, are sort of psychogeographies of hybrid space. And for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with this term psychogeography, comes from uh, the Situationist International, and Guy Debord of that group defined it as, quote, the study of the precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organized or not, on the emotions and behavior of individuals. So I've discovered throughout my research um, this kind of specific, specific reference to a radical group like the Situationist International, and indeed to other members of a largely white male European canon of critical theory like Walter Benjamin and Henri Lefebvre and Deleuze and Guattari, uh, this connection is not necessarily an original insight on my, own, on my part. So locative media art practitioners, for example, have for many years now considered the ways in which such projects are capable of exploring complex, radical ideas of space and inhabitation and migration in ways that, in my opinion, are, both hold a lot of promise but are not entirely without their problems. So one example would be, one early example would be Urban Tapestries by art collective Proboscis, which was a pre-smartphone platform for annotating urban places with stories of everyday life in a London neighborhood. Another example would be John Craig Freeman's Border Memorial, a mixed reality meditation between, uh, sorry, a mixed reality meditation on migrants who have died attempting to cross the border between Mexico and Arizona. Locative media um, projects have also taken less visual forms as well, as in Brian Greenspan's locative storytelling project Story Trek, a spatial novel platform theorized by its creator as a form of utopian storytelling, or artist Terry, Terry Reeves' locative audio-only sidewalks was a which explore contested meanings of ecology and cultural heritage. So it also may go without saying that the survey of projects begs us also to think about who is designing these types of media and for whom, and to consider the rich possibilities of using such media for operationalizing theories of space and habitation and migration that go beyond the kind of typical references to the largely white male European body of critical theory. So on that note, it's also crucial, crucial to consider the emerging social geographies within hybrid space and how mixed reality locative media, particularly games like Pokemon Go and Ingress, are already becoming platforms uh, beyond the cities of the global north. So Ingress has set up several million active players around the world. The game is even quite popular in China, where because of the firewalling of Google services upon which Ingress relies, many players must either jailbreak their phones or establish VPNs to play. So it would be short-sighted to consider ignoring the global intersectional dimensions of how people will use and already use locative mixed reality media in the future. So there are already at least uh, 2.6 billion active smartphone subscriptions in the world uh, by 2020 that are projected to be 6 billion, and that doesn't even account for the ways in which such media are increasingly migrating across interfaces to wearables like Apple's Watch or Microsoft's HoloLens. So the geography of hybrid space may be uneven, but it is truly global, increasingly accessible and immersive, and generating new ways of being public. So locative mixed reality media at the moment seem like useless diversions, but I would argue that they are in fact working upon us, the users, uh, situated within different identities. Um, sorry. <laughs> They're working upon us, conditioning perceptions of space and acting as a kind of praxis for different social and spatial protocols. So more thoughtful iterations of media have made attempts at a kind of seamful design, where the affordances of different users situated within different identities are foregrounded or even as a kind of disruption of normative spatial experiences highlighting social and political issues. But in their most mainstream forms, um, 
Mixed reality reinforce highly normative urban values. They decontextualize places and foster techno-optimistic imaginaries which are either amenable to or simply blind to the spatial protocols of overlapping systems of control, particularly how these systems such as capitalism, racism, and colonialism have forcibly displaced people in the name of progress or development. So speculatively, I'd like to think about where exactly all this is going. There have already been many documented cases of people using Pokemon Go, for instance, as a platform for anything from finding sexual partners to robbing people and even forms of social commentary. And so much has already been written about how social media, despite its proprietary status and, cooper and cooperation with the state, has served as a platform for organizing major political activities, such as the ones which, as I found it today, evidently inspired conferences like Theorizing the Web. Thanks. So in the contemporary moment we find ourselves, uh, is it so far-fetched to see how these mixed reality media could be used to mobilize political action? Right? So going back to Benjamin's montage method may be helpful for thinking about one potential tactic within this realm. Locative media uh, might be directed toward making the visible and invisible visible, of bringing to light things that are meant to be forgotten within the neoliberal city. Perhaps locative media, re locative mixed reality can be more effectively rescripted into something like an immersive place-based interfacial performance. Assemblages of people, artifacts, stories, and spaces that can be activated and expanded upon as sites of collective memory retrieval for radical speculation, of building and sustaining a hybrid commons, and as a means of developing or playing out liberating practices in space and time situated in human bodies. And these, assemblages, and these assemblages need not rely on ambivalent imperial infrastructures necessarily like GPS. Artist Philip Rondenberg, for instance, has been developing an open positioning system, a pirate positioning system which relies not on satellites, but on locally distributed DIY seismic vibration sensors. So I want to end by provoking the possibility that locative mixed reality media and their proprietary interfaces can be either hacked or reappropriated towards something resembling parody, critique, and subversion of the proprietary city. In any case, we can perhaps embrace them as a dispositioning systems, as a means of understanding and operationalizing theory through the interfaces and networks of transmediated landscapes that we already have and the ones to come. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll save questions for the end, so make sure to write them down so you don't forget them if need be. Um, next, we have uh, Benjamin Har uh, Harbour. Uh, he's a PhD candidate in sociology at the uh, Graduate Center at CUNY, um, and a, um, how do you say it again? Uh, Macaulay. Macaulay Institute uh, 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 Instructional Technology Fellow at Brooklyn College. He has published widely on queer theory, and digital media, and recently organized a two-day conference, Queer Circuits and Archival Times, Experimentation and Critique of Networked Data. Um, welcome, Benjamin. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a little worried about this presentation because it's part of a much larger piece of work um, where I'm sort of doing a lot of different things around sort of interrogating what I'm describing as resonances between queer ideas about sociality and queer epistemologies and the ways that um, digital sociality is sort of modifying um, social life. Uh, and just to note, I'm going to be talking about Snapchat a lot in this presentation. And mostly when I'm talking about Snapchat, I'm talking about this part of Snapchat, which is now fairly marginal, right? Where you like send a, a picture or video to another person, it disappears. You know, they have all these new products. And I'm not really going to mention much of, about those because I feel like the part that I'm talking about is the most interesting. So just to note. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with uh, talking about queer temporality. Um, and uh, there we go. Um, there's a lot of literature that I could have used to talk about this. Queer time, queer temporality is pretty vast literature. But uh, I picked these two because I feel like they sort of reflect. Um, some of the things that I am talking about when I'm d talking about sort of a queer resonance with the forms of sociality that are inspired or that digital capitalism are sort of producing. 
Um, I have this quote from Jose Munez uh, that talks about how the politics of the ephemeral is the opposite of visibility politics. It um, you know produces this uh, legacy of traces, glimmers, residues, and specks of things. And and I like this quote because it sort of frames this like queer response to a sort of visibility politics that. Um, has been a large part of like mainstream LGBT activism and it sort of you know reflects uh, the way that ephem ephemeral media or ephemeral sort of like performance or ephemeral in general is not um, you know it doesn't just disappear after it disappears right it sort of lives on in these queer ways right um, and I'm, I also have this uh, quote about the stretched out adolescences of queer culture um, and that's another thing that I'm really interested in in terms of Snapchat because, uh, you know, Snapchat, unlike a lot of the different sort of platforms, uh, major social media platforms, doesn't really like seemingly to me have a lot to offer like adults or people who work, right? And so this idea that, you know, one of the, the ways that like queer temporality works is that it sort of is a reconfiguration of the, you know, normative life cycle, right, that the, you know, the vision of, like, youthful exuberance, then you, you know, get married and go into adulthood and get a job, like, that in some ways Snapchat, I think, kind of benefits from a reconfiguration of how we understand life cycles and this sort of, like, idea of a stress, stretched out adolescence, or at least, like, I think that they hope that there is a sort of stretched out adolescence that they can continue to profit from. Um, all right, so uh, there's a lot of conversation in the world right now about privacy, of course. Um, and mostly, I would say, especially in academia, this is talking about privacy as it relates to um, the state or from capital, right, a sort of withholding or, you know, uh, worry about um, people giving too much away to um, powerful institutions. But the thing that I'm going to talk about in querying the public and the private is um, an idea of privacy that's more interactional, that um, you can kind of see in maybe this quote from Michael Warner, where um, he talks about how privacy and the bounds of privacy and the sort of way that we define the private and the public and negotiate between these things are not just like about, you know, what happens to your information or, you know, whether or not you can protect yourself from the state, but it's also about elaborating new worlds of culture, and particularly in terms of gender and sexuality, the, there's a long history of sort of queer work that complicates distinctions between public and private um, that I won't get into, but that, you know, I think that one of the ways that queer theory can sort of um, add to a conversation around privacy and digital media more broadly is to sort of think about this, um, you know, complication here, the idea that, you know, the ways that privacy and publicity gets talked about on the internet um, can also be sort of like complicated and, and doesn't have to be so, you know, binary. Um, and, and so part of this to me is that like I'm interested not just, you know, in moving away from a binary, I'm interested in moving away from a sort of insistent discussion about the loss of privacy and the ways that people are, you know, sort of like unwilling dupes and, you know, or uninterested, right? There's a lot of talk about how we can educate people or educate youth or um, do something to like make people understand that, you know, their privacy is, is, um, is being lost. But, you know, and, and, and I say this not to like, you know, make light of that work. I, I truly do think it's really important. But I also think that sometimes when you just talk about privacy in the context of loss, you sort of um, lose out on the ways that 
um, you know, giving up privacy is, is an important part of what, what we do as, as public people. Um, and, you know, one of the things that is troubling about just thinking about privacy in terms of loss or lack or removal is that there is this thing that I'll talk about in a second that, uh, you know, when you frame privacy around loss, oh my god, um, <laughs> You provide an opening for different kinds of um, profitable forms of securitization, right? And so I have this Wendy Chung article or quote right here where she talks about the epistemology of outing that depends on the illusion of privacy, which it must transgress. And I think that that's kind of, you know, gets at this, you know, idea that I, I'm going to keep talking about that there's something about the way that the discourse of privacy, I think, leads us to a desire for a sort of like fidelity to companies that can help us, you know, be more, you know, retrenched in, you know, not so scared of the ways that our privacy is being lost. And I think that's dangerous. All right, so, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you know I'm going to go through pretty quickly um, these little minor objects of everyday digital life, um, shading, subsex, and shadow that I feel like are sort of important and not talked about enough in terms of like framing our experience of using these devices that we use all the time. Um, there's <laughs> this is a um, screenshot from a, a Snapchat story which um, I see a lot of stuff like this on Snapchat, right? Like, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, media that sort of talks about the way that the youth are sort of moving beyond labels and stuff. And, and so I thought it would be nice to pair that with this Jasper Puar quote, where we could sort of start thinking about, you know, the differences between gay, gay and straight or like what those categories mean through what she calls the quotidian and banal activities of sexual self-elaboration. And that's kind of a little bit what I'm going to be doing. Uh, so I am interested in some you know, pretty minor aspects of Snapchat, but I think they're important. Um, this screenshot notification uh, is what I'm talking about, the, the pink thing there and the green one on the bottom. Um, you know, Snapchat often gets talked about in terms of privacy or desire for privacy or desire for, you know, having a sort of lower stakes um, form of communication. But, you know, they've actually made it a lot easier to, you know, save images and to take screenshots and whatever. And, and what's interesting to me about that is that it uh, seems to suggest a sort of gamification almost of privacy or, or like turning privacy into a sort of negotiation or a kind of play, right, where you, you know, interact with people and maybe progressively send racier and racier pictures and if they don't screenshot your media, maybe you'll like start to trust them. So, so there's an interesting way that this like little symbol, I think, has allowed the sort of negotiation between people on, on Snapchat to be a little bit more playful. And my favorite thing about Snapchat that apparently everybody else I know hates, is this aspect of Snapchat where when you get a snap, you have no idea whether or not it was sent to just you or if it was sent to like 20 different people, right? I mean, you of course can use context and stuff to understand that, but, you know, it's a fascinating, you know, for me it's, that speaks to the way that like this strategy that was clearly a way for Snapchat to sort of increase metrics, right, to increase the amount of snaps that are sent, sort of almost encourages a sort of like promiscuous kind of sociality, right, that you might, um, instead of just sending that naked picture to your partner, you might send it to a couple other people and see who, you know, see what happens. <laughs> and so, oh wow, I'm gonna run out of time. So in contrast to that, I, I am thinking about Apple, right, as being the sort of securitization, the retrenchment, the um, ways that the scary open internet um, sort of like provides a, you know, form of um, comfort, right? And 
I'm not going to get into this too much, but I do a similar kind of analysis here of the read receipt as a sort of way of, you know, keeping you at a sort of state of alertness. I don't know how many people actually, you know, keep those turned on. I don't really know very many people um, who do, but it is, I mean, it's only my mother really, actually. <laughs> but, you know, there's something like really, you know, intense about it that we can talk about later. Um, and then this find my friends thing, which I feel like really is evoked by the image itself where you have like two people literally attached to each other, which is their app where you can share your location with people indefinitely, right? Um, and here's uh, other things that mm, I'll just talk about later. But, you know, the, you know, the, I guess final word here for me is that there are, you know, different kinds of ways that uh, risk can be managed in the internet age. And I'm trying to sort of think about ways in which uh, we can imagine infrastructures where risk taking is part of the pleasure of using digital technologies instead of this sort of way of you know, making people feel like they need to sort of um, move into these centralized, protective, like, bubbles, like, like Apple. I'll stop there. Outstanding. Um, so next, we have uh, Caitlin Kerner. She is a PhD candidate at um, Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Her research combines prior experience in conflict analysis and resolution with research and communications on mesh networks, infrastructure, and a, uh, the history of alternative media. Her current project focuses on the intersections of media infrastructure and social change. She also does not really like cats. That's an understatement. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. I was like, now my nerves are going because you said cat. All right. Um, how is everybody? Um, like you all, I got many a very personal email, but also a very alarming email, about 12 minutes, 12 minutes, 12 minutes for presentations. Um, and because I'm used to cramming 20, 30 minutes into 15 minutes, 12 is just like, I, I'm done, I can't do this. Um, so I've decided to do something a bit different for myself today. And instead of presenting sort of on a formal research project that I've conducted, I want to talk today about the foundations of my research, the things that drive it, that get me up in the morning and nerding out all day by myself. Um, and I'm hoping that this can sort of spark conversation either in Q&A or after. Um, and on that vein, I also want to start with a bit of a story about a first year undergraduate intro communications course. Uh, my favorite lecture in that class is always on the internet. Um, and I love it because it, when you're talking about the internet to kids born in the late 90s, <laughs> let that sink in a second, um, they're sort of, they, they think they know everything about the internet. And there's absolutely nothing that I, the pre-internet, totally historic human being at the front of the room, can tell them that they don't already know. Um, I, challenge accepted, right? Like, come on, little people, I got you here. So the first thing I ask them to do is to think about the internet and draw it for me. Grab a piece of paper, just draw me a picture. Um, a couple minutes go by, I collect those up, and I'm gonna give you a smattering of what I see here. Now, these are recreations, and um, if you wanna know about the drawing of this later, we can talk about it, but this is what I see a lot, <laughs> right? Like, all right, I gotcha. Here's another one. It's super gloomy where my students live, right? We go here, get a lot of that, a lot of that. These are my philosophical students. They're really thinking about it here. And then like, come on now. Good wait, right? Like the girl who cannot handle cats. Hundreds some students handing you these. Um, and I'm like, okay, you know, we've had a good time with this. Uh, but let me push this a bit. So then I'm gonna ask them, what do you think about this if I tell you that this is the internet? And this is the internet? And this is the internet? Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so at this point, I'm getting a couple reactions. 
One, I've got my like just turned off extra in the Walking Dead look. That's about 10%. They all look that way all the time. I don't take it personally. Um, and then I've got some students here where they start thinking about it, right? Like the, you know, eyebrows are sort of furrowed in and they're like, okay, she's going somewhere. I'll follow her. And then I've got some that they're just like cognitive dissonance. Not going to happen. Grabbing their phones, cuddling them tight. Like, no, the internet is in my back pocket. It follows me around everywhere I go. <clears throat> Whatever that was, not happening. Um, and as fun as it is to sort of do this exercise, this is also the whole point. Um, and so as much as I can sort of laugh off, you know, millennials and their lives, the idea that for them the internet is the content on their screen not the hardware of which it comes through, is something that I think we need to spend a lot more time on. The idea that the internet is an object, it's an abstraction, and it comes to us through ideas and labor and basically stuff. It is a thing, right? And so that's where I kind of want to go. Now, don't get me wrong. I get the focus on content. I'm not saying because you are looking at me like, mm, okay. Um, that's important. It's straight up, I, I'm never going to argue that. We are a network society. Um, but the hardware is something that we've often left to mathematics, engineering, things like that. So what happens when social, like social scientists get their hands on it? And that's what I want to start looking at today. So in my research, I really try to foreground the like boring background elements of the internet. Like, how can I make this stuff like super sexy again so we can all get into it and nerd out about it? Um, and part of what I do with that is I really try to remember and to utilize Lisa Parks here. She's fabulous, read her, you'll love it. Um, and the idea of the infrastructural imaginary. So when we go about thinking about communications and technology, how can we think of it um, in terms of an infrastructure? How are those, infra like where are those infrastructures located? Uh, who controls them? What do they do? And by applying this to my research, I found that there is a lot of really interesting work being done, sort of on the backstage element, um, and things that we don't necessarily see, but are happening and really having a huge impact on how we experience the internet. So really thinking of the infrastructure of communications, that's where I want to go. Um, I primarily work on mesh network development, uh, but this can apply to satellites mobile phones, you name it, take it, use it, see what you can do with it. Um, so mesh networks, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with them. So really, what are they really quick? Um, a mesh network is a network typology. Uh, it's a form of communica communication infrastructure where each node relays data for the network as a whole. All mesh nodes cooperate in the distribution of data in the network, allowing people and devices to seamlessly inter-network without the use of a pre-existing communications infrastructure. Mesh networks can operate as standalone infrastructure, or they can tap into the backbone of the commercially provided internet, providing access to a group of users by a single link. Um, in terms of mesh networks, most people are familiar with sort of the free Wi-Fi that you get in the museum here, city centers, um, coffee shops, festivals. Those are mesh networks and terms of a typology and a philosophy, uh, but they're often owned and controlled by large telecommunications corporations. Um, they often have city influence and finance coming into it. And without being totally alarmist, uh, if you have to click agree on a terms of service, you are an entangled web of control and monitoring and all those super fun things that uh, come along with that if you've ever read one of those terms of service. The mesh networks I work with are independent, they're community owned, um, and a lot of the groups that I'm looking at and that I work with are really looking at communications infrastructure from a social justice lens. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so for example, we've got community owned and operated uh, mesh networks that are challenging issues of ownership. So we've got uh, Chiboxo Community Net, CCN. This is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We've got New York's very own Oh, that, ah, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> we've got NYC Mesh. They're super awesome. <clears throat> You're going to love them. Um, so CCN is a registered Canadian charity uh, and a volunteer organization that happens to be the first non-profit, publicly run telecommunications company in Atlantic Canada. 
And then NYC Mesh is working to create a free, resilient, standalone communication system. Um, these have no central server, no central, no single ISP, right? So when we think about ownership and in the hands of groups uh, like these community groups, we don't have to sort of stretch too far to think about uh, what can happen um, with affordability, availability, speed, configuration, usage, data mining, um, when all of that is in the hands of the users and not in the hands of profit. Um, now, this is, this, is, this is my jam right here. Um, when we're looking at mesh networks at, and um, social change and activism, um, and some of the most fascinating work I think is being done in this space, because the real idea here is that the ability to organize um, and to mobilize to create change is really predicated on the ability to communicate without impediment. Um, from various groups. And that's where these two groups are really coming in. So the first ones that comes to mind is the Free Network Foundation. They're really uh, active during the Occupy Wall Street movements. They put up freedom towers, is what they call them here, um, in the encampments, encampments. And from there, they were able to provide an alternative communications network to activists. Uh, Liam Young and his drones. Who doesn't want a drone, right? Like, I totally want one. Um, I asked for Christmas, didn't get it. Um, so from these drones, uh, he's able to transmit Wi-Fi signals and create a network and they can sort of, it's a pirate network, so it comes in, swarms an area, projects, uh, and can disperse with like escaping detection and things of that. Um, I think Liam Young sort of said it best in an interview to Time magazine, um, so I'm going to quote him verbatim here. At a large scale, you can imagine these systems crossing back and forth across national borders, occupying international airspace, so that it's more difficult for particular jurisdictions to legislate them. The more slippery and fluid the infrastructure is, the more difficult it is to close it down. So when we think of delivery, circulation, and that with communications in the hands of activists, um, there's a really like real challenge being mounted against surveillance, protest policing, data mining, uh, control. And a lot of the time we think of those sort of challenges in terms of software like Tor, but people are taking it straight to the hardware itself. Um, doing some really cool stuff. Uh, so the time I have today, there's my cats again. Um, I can't introduce all the case studies I want to get into the methodology. Um, oh, I can do this, okay. All right, uh, so really what I wanna do is just get everyone to start thinking about how we can use an infrastructural imaginary, how we can start looking at the nuts and bolts of our technology um, and how we can use that to, to truly push forward in our future and current sort of theoretical, uh, methodological sort of trajectories when we're studying the internet, the internet as a thing. Um, yeah, okay, I, I made it within 12. Yeah. <laughs> Someone drop a mic. <laughs> oh, and I'm not on the Twitter thing because I don't tweet, but feel free to email me. Cool, thank you so much. Thanks. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, so our uh, uh, last but not least um, uh, presenter is Anna Jobin. Uh, she is a PhD candidate with a multidisciplinary background in sociology, economics, and information management. Originally from Switzerland, she is currently at Cornell researching uh, uh, interactions with algorithmic systems. Uh, let's welcome Anna. Okay, hello everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks also for these fantastic insights uh, from my fellow panelists. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, from my side, I'm, I thought I was going to talk about something completely different, but actually it comes together, uh, it's very complementary to the talk you've just heard, uh, because how does the internet get financed when, uh, well, how does the, do the cats get financed when it's not a mesh? We don't have time for this, so let me ask straight away, who of you has heard of Macedonian teenagers uh, lately? Yeah, right. <laughs> they have uh, been all over the news because a few of them have become the media's poster children, and I think it's <laughs> about uh, how to make money getting rich through internet advertising while posting fake news. And um, I won't be uh, talking about Macedonia, nor about teenagers, but I will be talking about internet advertising. 
Um, I'll offer a glimpse into how the people actively involved in digital advertising make sense of their work and their ties based on an empirical study. Because digital advertisers, they translate between the technological specificities and traditional advertising approaches for clients, potential clients, and they sustain the very industry that sustains them. Okay. Before focusing on digital advertising, let's address the elephant in the room, which is the fact that advertising is nothing new. Uh, nor is it uh, the fact to rely on advertising for, uh, as a business model, just think of traditional media context, radio, TV, uh, newspapers. And much like traditional media context, digital advertising is a key source of revenue for many contemporary corporations, although its place and role within particular markets may uh, vary. And some things are new with digital advertising. There's, of course, the technology, but there are also, also changes that are concomitant with this new medium, uh, such as easy access to abundance of new metrics, possibility of personalization. And these changes are also reflected in a somewhat modified industry structure that privileges vertical integration. Let's talk, for instance, uh, let's take, for instance, audience metrics which have been a crucial commodity within the media industry because audience metrics inform <laughs> media and advertisers about their potential public. And different kinds of methodologies and data coexist in what has become a well-populated and even somewhat regulated sub-industry. They're not only media outlets and advertisers, also audience metrics agencies and even an institution auditing the rating agencies. And the purpose of audience metrics has always been to know as much as possible about the audience's opinion, interests, and they have been conceptualized through survey evaluation, extrapolations, or inference. And the knowledge, or I would want to insist on the fact that the claims of knowledge about the audience's interests, di they direct advertising, and thus money, in certain directions rather than others. That's why they're crucial. And with digital advertising, the whole advertising ecosystem has been impacted, because there are not only new ways of advertising, there are also new ways of making claims about knowledge about the audience and its interests. So digital platforms such as Facebook and Google, they provide not only the medium within which the ads will appear, they are the same ones who also provide their own metrics about their audience and its interests, as well as their own dedicated algorithmic platform to create and manage the digital ads and to access the metrics. So there exist several kinds of digital advertising and some of them work differently, but I focus uh, my attention on one particular type of Google <coughs> ads, the search ads. Um, found it, so Google doesn't need an introduction anymore, but what needs to be said that it has been a, become alphabet, it's now a market value of over $500 billion. And although today we can talk about self-driving cars and so on, it still generates most of its revenue through its initial business model, which consists of search ads, pairing advertising to search queries. But to do so, Google relies heavily on other people, on digital advertisers notably. So when thinking about <coughs> online advertising, digital advertisers are often overlooked because the focus is mostly on platforms or on users. However, these advertisers, uh, uh, and be they marketing managers or account planners or whatever their job title, uh, they perform crucial work for Google and for Facebook and, for, and the likes because they act as intermediaries between the digital platforms and the internet users and the advertising clients. And these advertisers must show a specialized understanding of the algorithmic platform, of the digital audience metrics, as well as the specific market logics. So in my research, I propose to consider online advertising as a result not only of data and of algorithms, but also of a set, a set of activities and narratives by specific actors who must make sense of this new complex technological environment and new uh, uh, way of making knowledge claims. Therefore, in order to better understand online advertising, it is crucial to understand what participating stakeholders make of it. Which brings me to <laughs> online advertisers. Again, uh, it's, just an overall, it's just an overall term because no matter the name by which they go for my purpose. They hold not only a very important position in their industry, I do find that they are also key actors for research because as experts, they are bound to have a discourse about what they do. And which is great when you interact interaction with algorithms because uh, people like you and me, if I ask you why did you uh, click the way you clicked or Google uh, put in the words in Google the way you did, I don't know about you, I wouldn't be able to articulate it because it just happens the way it does and I could find uh, justification afterwards. But Google, ad but digital advertisers, it's their job to know what they are doing and to be able to explain what they do and why they do. So in the time I have left, 
I would like to present some preliminary results of my ongoing research project that looks into algorithmic advertising. And um, the results are based on multiple hours of qualitative uh, in-depth interviewing with uh, digital advertisers in an ethnographic setting. And while there is so much to be said, <laughs> I will focus on three particular points that seem interesting and interlinked. So the first one is how uh, advertisers make sense of digital advertising in general and their role in the ecosystem in particular. And uh, we're at the conference about theorizing, so let me just point out that the theory of sense making, the sense making approach by Carl Way, it provides great analytical <coughs> tools to situate the dis individual discourse in organizational, temporal, as well as social settings. So digital uh, advertising, the people I spoke to, uh, they almost all seem to agree spontaneously. They said things like, well, digital advertising is inevitable anyway. So that was one of the words that I kept hearing. It's inevitable. It's, it's there anyway, because how, otherwise, how would the internet get financed? Um, I, I like to, extra, to propose it is <laughs> with your talk, right? Because it could be otherwise. Some even went as far as to laud their work of tweaking ads and ad campaigns as being beneficial for internet users, uh, to say, or to say with a quote, since there has to be internet advertising, it might as well be relevant. And so, um, although they point out their unique position as expert of the advertising platform in question, they don't necessarily see themselves as active contributors to the overall advertising system, but merely as professionals who simply execute according to almost obvious rules created by Google and the very existence of the internet. So this almost ambiguous stance transpires also in the second point, which is their relation to Google. Because of the in-depth interviewing, it was easily possible to have answers that went beyond the official declarations. Uh, as the interview goes further and further, we started very formal and it became more informal uh, after some time. And often at the beginning, no contact with Google was mentioned, but the longer discussion uh, went on, the more eager they were to actually point out how well they, 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 how well they go on, they get, get on with Google. Because the digital advertisers I talked to, they were certified by Google, and most of them uh, have a, ha, they have a relatively uh, frequent co contact with Google's key account managers, people at Google who are available and help according to budget, number of clients, and so on. And so one advertiser would even say, depending on these parameters, Google will roll out the red carpet for advertisers. Well, of course, they make the money, you would say, but I, I like that analogy. Um, and when the, sometimes the privilege, however, it breaks down. For instance, when there's a new uh, when there's a new feature about how ads get uh, displayed that was not uh, that was officially announced, but then one advertiser would say, "Well, why didn't my key account manager didn't tell me that before?" But then again, probably they didn't know either, and which shows that those key account manager they don't have the advantage of actually knowing better. They just inside the company. But yeah, and. Uh, and so, oh yeah, at the beginning, often people speak Google. What is Google when they speak about it? So that's another thing I was looking into. Google is often, at the beginning, it's the website and the algorithm or data or provider of algorithm data. The longer discussion goes on, the more and more Google is referred to as a company or uh, as embodied in certain of its employees. And very rarely only, but that's why I like it even the better, those different instances, algorithms and people, they get conflated as they do in this quote about Google. These people really exist. They're not at all black boxes. Because I don't think anyone said people were black boxes. It's rather the whole thing. Algorithms are black boxes. But I, I, I should have illustrated that better, right? People <laughs> as black boxes. Whatever. So. Um, the third point is related to what I said before, which is that digital advertisers must not only be experts of the digital, but also of the traditional advertising. And it shows in the way, in their rhetoric, how they try to uh, navigate different worlds and they are in between. So they must, be ad um, they must adapt uh, what they know about traditional advertising to the platform metrics and vice versa. They use concept of traditional advertising. Uh, so like they speak of the sales funnel and so on, but the same person who would use that example would later on say, well, actually, you know, the concept of sales funnel, it doesn't even apply anymore because everything's different now with digital. And uh, you have that at different point of the conversation. And I find it really telling the fact that they have to navigate in between making sense of it on the one hand and on the other hand discrediting. So I, uh, I find that a strong indication that they are between the two worlds and constantly having to translate between the two. 
their clients benefit from their expertise, and in a certain way, Google benefits from their free advising and advertising for their advertising system. So to conclude, it can be said that digital advertisers navigate a complex socio-technic environment where they make sense of formal but also many informal norms conveyed by a technology largely outside of their control on the one hand, but they reenact themselves the belief in the way this technology works in activity and discourse on the other hand. So as intermediaries, <laughs> these people are sustained by and simultaneously sustaining the way digital advertising works. Thank you. Outstanding uh, group of theorists. We're going to open the floor for questions. Uh, before I before we do, I want to make an interesting observation that in, uh, we all talked about, we all talked about infrastructure, and um, you know in infrastructure studies, it's often assumed that infrastructure is invisible, right? It's cats, not the servers. Um, and so I was wondering to start off discussion. How is it that your work either reinforces this idea that infrastructure is invisible until it breaks down, or uh, does your work challenge that idea? Anyone can start. <laughs> I guess I'll take it um, right off the top. Oh, do I need to use this? Yeah, because of the okay. last um, my, my research is a direct response to that. So there's a lot of theories in sort of the critical communications infrastructure world that say, you know, we don't think about it until it's broken, right? Like if I turn the, like the internet went off right now, like everyone would gasp, computers closed, like there's a thing, you get that it's there. No one right now is thinking about the pipes of water running under us. If it burst, we're thinking about it. Um, and sort of one of the, that's one of the reasons why, at least in, in the field of communications, I think uh, there's been a lot of work that sort of jumps over that and goes straight to the content and goes straight to the screen, because that's where the really cool stuff that we can see right now is happening. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens before it gets there. And what I want to do is sort of make that cool again and get that going and look at it before it's broken. Um, so the question of infrastructure is really interesting for me in particular because I am not a technologist. Um, I'm an urbanist. And so a lot of what I studied actually relates directly to infrastructure. And there's this kind of idea of infrastructure as sort of a phantasmagoria, right? Which is kind of speaking to the fact that like you sort of take it for granted uh, until it's broken. But also you sort of take for granted the sense in which infrastructure defines like e the essential elements of like our culture and like even our humanness in a way. And to make this sort of to use the example of what you just uh, mentioned about pipes breaking, you know, it's like really basic infrastructure, things that we kind of take for granted are really modern phenomenon, right? Like they're basically only about like 150 years old. Um, and in fact, there's sort of different ways in which kind of quality of life are defined by access to those infrastructures and that's very unevenly distributed. So it's really interesting to kind of consider that in light of these sort of, uh, sort of high technologies or digital technologies as well. Anyone else? Or we can open the floor for questions. The, um, this uh, talk is entitled, I mean, this conference, uh, this part of the conference is uh, entitled Ethics of Conne Connection. And I found it interesting that none of the panelists actually mentioned the word ethics in their talk. And so I'm wondering if that might be somehow a reflection of the nature of the web, or does the web actually suggest some sort of ethics by its very nature? Yeah, it's all yeah. Yeah. I, I would like I would like to ask uh, the organizer of the conference why they put that title uh, <laughs> on our panel. <laughs> because I find it very interesting to, to find myself in it. But, um, so, so there's the word. Then again, yes, it's not the word ethics. What I find really interesting, and what I probably had also in my proposal, is the words about social values. So what social values, uh, what are the values that get uh, uh, embedded or not, and where do they come from? So do they come from? That's one of, one of the questions I ask. Do they come from the advertisers? Do they come from, are they embedded in infrastructure the way technology works? Uh, or how does it work and how do you see it circulate? Unfortunately, I don't yet have many answers to this, though I didn't feel ready to present it uh, today, but that might be a hint uh, to answer your question. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I don't really usually talk about my work in the context of ethics. I usually talk about it in terms of politics. And that is the language that I feel more comfortable in. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have a lot to add to that. Well, Anna, you, you just brought up a really great point, which is like the, the question of value and what we value and how that uh, is interpolated into kind of the, the logic of the network. So partially in my talk, which is about these like locative games, right, like Pokemon Go and Ingress, like what they do is like they kind of, within the logic of the game, express what the developers of those games value, at least in an urban environment, right? So what gets to be a part of the node but what gets to be a node in that network, right? And in the case of those games, it's always like, you know, businesses. It's always these really normative landmarks, right? Like tourist destinations, right? Which in the case of, you know, a place like New York City, it's like you find that the kind of uneven and unequal geography of the city is completely reproduced in the network of the game, right? And that's uh, really like kind of com gets to this question of value and how certain values are expressed through networks. Um, so I have a question maybe for uh, all four panelists, um, kind of going off of the idea of ethics as values. Uh, I'm wondering about the ways in which, I guess, popular, the popular image of the internet, for instance, with, with all of your students, how those certain popular images might suit certain people as opposed to other people within the larger interaction of us with the network. Um, and then maybe if each of you sort of want to speak to how we begin to sort of that. Could you guys have to uh, that? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. uh, um, is there? This one's longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically just to uh, rephrase that question very quickly, how are the, the sort of popular images that we have of the internet networks or um, <coughs> public and private, uh, how, how do some images uh, suit or work better for some parties within these interactions than others? Sure. Go. Well, I, yeah, um, I mean, so... In terms of like the thing I was talking about in terms of the public and the private, to me it seems like there is a certain way that discourses of privacy and the way that privacy is being talked about right now, even though often it's being talked about in a very critical way and you know talked about in the context of like we need more of it or we need to be protected from the state or from whatever that it actually ends up serving to some extent like companies like Apple or companies that have done a really successful job at sort of like centralizing a lot of different functions that people use on the internet because it you know cr creates this sort of like generalized affect that we're just sort of like you know uh, passively or without thought like distributing stuff all over and that it's kind of like hopeless for us to imagine a sort of life on the internet that isn't sort of like locked down and proprietary um, so yeah there's something about the the kind of topology of the network too which is really interesting because it's always so I mean it's, it's kind of popularly characterized as being very flat right it's so like the network is this kind of flattening, equalizing uh, mechanism in a way, right? Which I think can be both really great and has been used for great ends, but also can be really problematic because it tends to sort of brush over these, you know, sort of bumpy contours of that topology. Like, for example, like who has more or less power within that network? So in a way, I think like that sort of ide idealized version of like a network as being pure horizontality in a way can serve ends that sometimes are like great but also not so great depending on who's really employing that that particular metaphor I guess. Yeah and I would say I pick up on the same thing so something that um, I try to do in talks um, and maybe not as successfully today is, is to keep like the idea of the internet in quotation marks because we 
often talk about it as a singular thing, um, but the commercially produced internet available to you is networks upon networks upon networks upon networks, and they are diverse, and they do different things. Um, and there is, uh, sort of when we talk about it in a singular way, we take all of that complexity out of it, and it becomes this simple like on-off transaction. Um, I send you money, you send me the internet, like you're renting space. Um, and it's more complicated than that. And there's a lot of innovation that's happening um, in that area. Uh, so <coughs> I sort of mentioned about my background being conflict analysis and resolution. Um, I really started sort of in the space of um, activism, social media. Uh, and I started to, to get a little bit frustrated in that um, we were sort of talking about like, can Facebook cause revolution? And this was a number of years ago, a lot of these debates were settled. But I remember thinking, like, Facebook isn't a thing, it's a platform, and it goes on and it goes off, but if you don't have access to the internet, then this conversation is mute. And I sort of pulled back a little bit and sort of see what else I could find when I dug things up, and that's where I started to look at uh, networks. So uh, one of the most popular examples that comes up is like, well, yeah, in Egypt they turned the internet off. Well, no, they didn't. They turned a part of it off, the part that they were renting to people to access. The internet didn't go down. Um, and so when you start thinking of the various layers of the network, people were still on it. Um, and there's a great group, Telecomics, who were able to use old radios to tap into the parts that still existed. And so there's lots of um, challenge that's happening in that space that we often don't see because we don't know that we should be looking. And then once we're all totally looking for it, you'll see it everywhere. Um, so I guess that's what I would sort of answer to that. Do we need to talk about home advertising is serving? <laughs> <laughs> and how it might recreate inequality because of defining uh, people as consumers, uh, their work as consumers, I think. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but maybe during the break or <laughs> Another question? of youth, uh, of, image, of image, just like permanent immaturity. And, um, and I'm just wondering if you could kind of clarify for me a little bit, um, like how Snapchat, what Snapchat's doing there. Is Snapchat capturing that, defanging it, kind of depoliticizing it, or is Snapchat kind of, is, is Snapchat uh, uh, you know, a radical form of social media, be, you know, for this, you know, for, for kind of participating in this, you know, the, or, or capitalizing uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I talk about it mostly as a monetization of, of, of those ideas or whatever. And of course, I don't think that it's a sort of, you know, I don't think that people who uh, are working at Snapchat are probably reading queer theory. But I think that there is a way that it kind of makes sense that the new ways that you can profit off of people on the internet would sort of resonate with some of the ideas that you know uh, queer theory have been talking about. Queer theory theorists have been talking about for a long time. Um, so um, I don't see Snapchat as being a radical institution or even a queer thing, but I do think that they sort of provide a important space to um, have a particular kind of intimacy that I think that a lot of people are lacking because a lot of the different ways that we used to experience intimacy have been like put into these um, contexts like Facebook you know that are not particularly intimate for people right so I think it provides a sort of useful service to allow people to you know have a safer space to like experiment like in terms of their sexuality and you know it's doing interesting things but uh, you know the point that I made in the beginning of my talk where I was talking about how it's an increasingly marginal part of Snapchat I think is really important because the reason why it's an increasingly marginal part of Snapchat is because it's the hardest to monetize right and it to me speaks to the sort of problem of not only are we sort of 
replacing like you know things that maybe used to happen in public with a sort of privatized version, but we're trading that for uh, a privatized version of that that's also highly centralized and highly leveraged, right? So that Snapchat doesn't have a lot of, you know, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of incentive for them to maintain that, you know, uh, part of their infrastructure, especially because it like makes them, you know, sort of complicit as like pornography distributors, right? So. Um, all that to say, like, I think that probably for me, like, one of the key issues of, like, thinking about, you know, creating spaces for, like, queer sociality or, like, thinking about not just a sort of, like, capital ingestion of queerness, but actually, like, a proliferation is decentralization, which I think we're seeing actually just the opposite of. Hi, um, I'm curious, I know you all have some issue with uh, the idea of ethics and that vocabulary, but I am curious about that de decentralization and how it could interact with ethics in a kind of negative way. Uh, I've been working recently on advertising and child exploitation on YouTube, and when you talk to YouTube, when you talk to advertisers, when you talk to uh, content creators, they all say it's not our responsibility, they kind of blame this decentralized platform, even their own platform, like even YouTube, they say 400 hours of content are uploaded every minute. How are we supposed to keep track of what's happening there? Like, how are we supposed to regulate this? We can't. We can't control the thing that we've created. It's decentralized. Um, yeah. So I'm curious how those kind of dyna dynamics of centralization and decentralization feed into the idea of how people on the internet and internet providers and controllers kind of think about it. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, the problem with YouTube is that it's not decentralized, right? It's, it's like Google, it's a centralized company that is making its own sort of decisions about how to regulate things like that, um, that are, again, based upon this massive valuation that they have, right? And to me, like, the, you know, they could talk about the decentralization of YouTube in the way that, like, it's user-generated, free, for them, for Google content, but it's not decentralized as a, you know, in terms of the platform. And that's like, to me, like what uh, would be much more interesting in terms of like, I think producing like more ethical, I guess, ways of engagement online, right? It's not that, you know, we need platforms where like anybody can do anything, but we need a lot of different kinds of things. We need like, we need a world in which like, you know, it's not just like Facebook and Google and Snapchat like ingesting all things from the internet and people feeling that like in order to be connected to their friends they have to go to these three places or whatever, these three um, or five or six sites owned by a couple of companies. You know, to me it's like the, the you know, I think you'd start to see like more interesting ways of dealing with problems and also see like more interesting ways of like having connection in general if you didn't have it all controlled by like four different companies. No, I mean, I agree completely with Steph about uh, YouTube now <laughs> being effectively centralized. But I'm thinking because um, uh, I'm a peer rid of Mastodon. Okay, so that's this supposedly decentralized social network coming out. And I'm only just uh, getting, uh, reading up about what it is being said and not, but that would be a great question. So what would that change? In what way might it be ethical or not to use it? So I do, I, I do of course, agree with uh, my fellow panelists that um, uh, it's not only about values, it's also about power. So who get, has the power to enforce their values or not, uh, or gets heard or not? So when decentralized, what, what may we mean also remove, what, remove one instance, one main uh, mode of power and sort of distribute the power among them. So about Mastodon, what I, what is also, you, you um, connect yourself, well, like a mesh network, but you, you, <laughs> but you, you, but you do social network, uh, at, at the mesh network as a service. <laughs> 
as a social service. But what could happen is, uh, you, well, there's no consensual control anymore. So you could not necessarily know what will happen with your data, and you will have no one to point to at. Of course, you put those on a balance. I mean, I know which side I'd probably be on personally, but that would be uh, one of that would be one of the points we could discuss. As long as there is a company behind a service they provide, you could theoretically have a legal institution in place, and you put count accountability or not on those uh, institutions. When it's entirely distributed, it would be much more difficult when something goes wrong. But then again. I mean, you have to figure out those things in a way. You know, like, I keep thinking, because you know I'm writing about like queer, blah, blah, blah. I like, keep thinking about like gay bars, and like gay bars are private spaces that are trying to make profit. But there's a lot of them, especially in New York, and like if one of the gay bars starts to like sell your data or, you know, charges a lot more for drinks or does something problematic, you can go to another gay bar, but like, you, you can't really, I mean, you can do that with Facebook, but like, um, there's something about, you know, the way that I think um, we, I don't know, feel uncomfortable being on like, networks that there's not a lot of people or whatever, like, there's like this, you know, way that Facebook doesn't really have a lot to fear, I don't think, in terms of like, people going to the other social network or whatever. You know, they're just entrenched. And and so it would be like if all the gay bars like combined into one gigantic gay bar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really want to make it. Go for it. Well, it might, it, it might, if new legislation will uh, will uh, ask everybody to hand in their uh, Facebook password. I do think that would have an impact about how many people will use uh, Facebook. Uh, so, especially people who are international visitors, like myself, and we need this, uh, we need to cross borders. So, I am actually actively thinking of how much longer will I be able to use Facebook the way it is. Then again, uh, that's the big, if you have one point of you have one point of attack. Uh, one point of accountability, or one point not. And it goes, the good aspect is also less handy aspect depending on the social values that want to enforce, that are enforced by other institutions. So. Anyone else want to respond? I, I think I'm okay, yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. It was interesting for me to see both in Joshua's talk and in Anna's talk, the idea that monetization basically informs the intent and the vision of a lot of different products. So like Ingress and Pokemon Go being financed by this specific entity and advertising being the inevitable in how people monetize your content. I guess my question uh, for everyone is how do you find the changing of the channeling of finance uh, can change the politics and the intent of the products that you talk about? I'll do it. Go for it. Um, the finance is a big one in terms of mesh networks um, and infrastructure because you have to buy the nuts, you have to buy the bolts. You've got to, um, like in New York here, uh, NYC Mesh is a challenge because they have to rent space on roofs to set up super nodes. Um, and one of the reasons why I have chosen specifically to study independent, non-commercial me mesh networks is because of all the traps and entanglements that come with financing. So, for example, if you're looking at city Wi-Fi, um, often there is things in there that you agree to in terms of data mining, geolocation, all that stuff is imposed on the network you're using and they pull that. Um, a lot of the groups that I'm looking at and that I'm working with really want to strip all of those entanglements out. This is communication um, in sort of its uh, clearest form. They really just want people to be able to push their information around and not be worried that what they sort of say is going to pop up on them in another way or that uh, their usage is going to be metered and monitored and then they're going to get hit with overages charges and whatever that really means, overage what, or they're going to get throttled. Um, um, specifically in terms of like the activist networks, this is a big one when you're thinking about <coughs> protest policing um, and uh, 
communication mining and kettling that happens because there's an awesome algorithm that has just figured out on Twitter exactly where your protest is going and they're there before you. And so these sort of um, groups that I'm looking at want to strip all of that out. There's like a CCN um, is a nonprofit, strictly nonprofit. Um, and depending on uh, how you want to sort of participate, um, there are memberships that allow you voting rights because it is a community board um, and everything goes to a vote. And so in that sense, there's sort of this idea in some of these groups that um, every time you take funding, you take the entanglements that come with it. And so they're working very hard at uh, making sure that those streams align with what it is they want to do. So uh, I want to. Uh, I was told we need to keep a very strict time, and we are unfortunately out of time. So let's give our panelists a round of applause for serializing the web. And I'm sure they'll be around to answer more questions.